You know, because it, it, it really comes from our charismatic roots and, you know, singing that song, that all this is for you, all this is for you, you know, we sing that. But, you know, as time goes on, I, I just realize that, you know, really the, the everything that God is doing and, and the whole purpose of worship is actually for us. And I started seeing that up front here. I was like, you know, this is for us. This is all for us. Everything you've done is for us. Yeah. It, it's not, you know, God is not some egomaniac really? narcissist that goes, you know, I need more worshipers. Please go get more converts. It's quite, it's not quite enough. I need another billion. I mean, it, it, it isn't all for the Lord. Although when you fall in love with the Lord, then you go, Lord, you know, it, it's just all for, the idea is that it's all for his kingdom. So when you understand that and what his kingdom is, is to bring rightness in the world, to bring peace into the world, to bring joy into the world. And so when you understand that that is what this is all for, then, then that's true. It, it, because I understand that it can be too seeker sensitive and well, it's all about me, it's all about me. But then it can be too desperate and pleading that it's all about God, it's all about God, it's all about God. And then we just become slaves to, to worship God, to make him happy. But it really isn't. It, it is all about God's kingdom, which includes both. We, we, oh, the reason we honor and we worship the Lord is because of the goodness. Now, I honestly don't know what everyone else is singing about. Because I don't know about all the worship and honor and glory and praise happening when the end plan is just a destruction of the majority of mankind. I, I don't know what there is to sing about. Maybe, maybe then the worship becomes narcissist. Well, I'm just so thankful that it's all about the fact that I got saved, right? That, that I've made it out alive. And, and so that's where I think so much of worship in the past, and I, I see the Lord taking a new direction, has been, oh God, you know, my whole life's for you, and not me, but you, and I just lay down my life and surrender all, because I'm worthless, but, but you're good. And, and all of that comes out of a heart of kind of fear, right? It's like, God, I just want you to know that I, 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 I mean nothing to myself and you're kind of everything. So just like when you're counting all my sins, you'll remember, oh, but that mad guy, right? He said it's all for Jesus. So it's not, it's not about him. So that's good. That's good. We'll record that, right? And so much of worship becomes part of me trying to impress God, right? So it's like, how can we really impress God with how committed we are to God? And you know, God, God's just not looking for commitment. He, he's looking for lovers, right? He's looking for people that would just be in love and, and really enjoy it. Not saying, oh God, I'm really committed to you. God's like, oh, I wish you just actually loved me. You know? Victoria was joking with me this morning and she said, honey, I just want you to know I'm committed to you. <laughs> That's how we joke, right? She's teasing me. I'm like, that just doesn't feel warm and fuzzy. Right? <laughs> oh, you're committed. Like, what, what are you having to push through that it's resulted in just you're committed to stay in the relationship? You know, that's not something you share on Valentine's Day. Honey, I just want you to know I'm committed to our relationship. So, okay, you're not enjoying it? You know, you're not enjoying our relationship? So, you know, God wants us to enjoy him, not just be committed to him, right? That's, that's not what the Father wants from us. And so... So when the worship comes out of a heart of desperation to try to prove to God, you know, your level committed, well, Lord, I'll, I'll give up everything. Lord, wherever you send me, I'll go, you know. I, and this is the stories we heard growing up. People were so scared to commit their lives to Jesus because it's like, what if God then forces me or sends me to Africa and I don't want to go to Africa, you know. And actually, Africa is quite nice in places, you know. Lots of people go really like it. People vacation there. <laughs> But, but the fear was, is that God's going to send me somewhere I don't want to go or make me do something I don't want to do. I used to hear these stories that I thought in the past were great testimonies. You know, you'd see a, a great athlete and, and get on and, and people were saying, you know, you know, you were scouted by all these NFL teams and why didn't you play football? Well, because God told me to give it up and, and just to go into the ministry. I'm like, buddy, buddy. That's so sad. It's like, yeah, well, God told me I gotta, I can't have fun anymore playing football because that's just worldly. And I gotta go serve Him. You know? yeah. 
It's like, well, maybe God gifted you to play football so you could go and be good and make lots of money and then, you know, I don't know, start lots of things and, and advance the kingdom in that way. Why, why is that bad? But there's this idea that I'm going to sacrifice the thing that I love to do so that God will really see how committed and serious I am. And this is the death of Christianity. This is yeah. We've got so many Christians doing stuff they don't want to do. Yeah. So God's got to influence other people to do their job that they don't really want to do now. And their stuff. Yeah, what a mess, right? Yeah. I think of that often as missions. I love what Jamie, the very worst missionary, says. She goes, it's poverty tourism. I think about that for a minute. You know? what, what is so pushed missions in, in our world and in, in with, with so many of these young people going off on these short-term mission trips, right? It's, it's just this idea of, then I feel like I'm doing something for God and that God's impressed because I've, I've gone and done a mission. Now, does God want us to do missions? Probably, but let me tell you something. Every time we go and build a house in Mexico, we're taking the jobs away from Mexicans. You need to think about that. And is this the best way we can do mission work, right? We, we, raise, we raise tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands of dollars to send all our young people and go on these mission trips where that money would be better spent to go hire a couple of really good contractors, go down to Mexico and hire a bunch of Mexicans to build homes because they're looking for jobs. Sometimes you have to think of it that way is how would you feel? You know, Calgary's economy is, is kind of... And, and your job is a is you're a finishing carpenter, you know. And the Chinese keep sending missionaries over here, and they're building everything. And you're like, I I build things. Uh, that was my job till all you lovers came over and or started building stuff in Jesus' name and just put us all out of work, right? It's not. And we have to think beyond that. So so when we think about kingdom, we we've got to leave the ground of saying this is about me. And trying to impress God in what I'm doing and be led by the Spirit to do what you want to do. You know, the desires that are already in your heart, God's placed them there. And He wants you to follow them. He doesn't want you to deny them. You know. He doesn't want you to be denying the desires that He's put in you. You know, unless those desires are harmful. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, I desire to get drunk every night. Well, maybe, maybe God's going to work on that. <laughs> Because maybe that's being driven by pain instead of his spirit. But how do we get to this place? How do we get to the place where we are no longer doing these things to try to impress God or get into good standing with God? Because there's some people that are truly called the missions. And, and so they move to these countries and they go. But still, sometimes the best missionary is the person that's born and raised in that culture in that country to go and raise those people up to preach the gospel in those places right and sometimes that's a calling but we need to be called by the spirit and not out of a sense of guilt not out of a sense of obligation not out of a sense of christian duty because there is no such thing as a christian duty there's only such thing as being led by the spirit what is the spirit of god directing you to do what and, and how, the only way you know that is what do you want to do what are your desires to do and if you're in a place doing something that you hate doing or you don't like doing or you just feel you're doing it to honor God somehow then you need to reevaluate what you're doing and say maybe I shouldn't be doing this maybe, you know this is not bringing me any joy this isn't that the, you don't need to suffer for Jesus in that way so how do we do it? How do we know these things? So I, it, it was, it's funny, but I, I was thinking I wanted to title this message, Does Size Matter? <laughs> and I, you know, I know, it's good. I, I was thinking, does it matter? We, we often talk about faith in terms of size, right? And, and we get this honestly. And I'll, I'll read one portion out of Matthew. And I'm going to go right to it so I don't forget it and not read it. Matthew 13, 31, it says, uh, Jesus is teaching in parables. And he says, he presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that, and then it quotes the Old Testament, the birds of the air can come and nest in its branches. 
So we get this terminology also when we hear Jesus saying, uh, O you of little faith. So we get the term little faith, and so we're attributing uh, faith to a size. Um, we also um, hear, you know, if, if you had faith, you know, the size of a mustard seed, you know, then you could speak to this mountain that would be moved. And so that has left Christians, believers, always asking the question, how do I increase the size of my faith? How do I get bigger faith? I don't have enough faith for that situation. I don't have enough, so how do I get more? How do I grow it? How do I make it bigger? And so the, the problem becomes is that we're all trying to figure out ways that we can get our faith to be bigger and, and to increase its size because we go, it's small. So when we hear that, if I had faith the size of the mustard seed, then I could move mountains. And you go, and, and so we're left thinking, okay, well, I can't move mountains, so I don't even think I could start my truck by faith in this cold, so... Like Barry did, and Barry's got almost no faith. I mean, he <laughs> tried to get here the other week. He didn't even pray over his truck. <laughs> right? So, you, so you're left kind of feeling, I can't move mountains. I can't even start my truck. So how small is my faith? I have atomic faith. That's, what, that's the size of my faith. It, it, I have cork faith. All right? I'm like the church of cork faith. And so I, I, I feel then, so I started asking the Lord the question, well, what is it with this idea of size? Like, I, I, need, I need the kind of size. But actually, when you, you look at the Greek, the, the word size is, is really the inappropriate translation there. The idea is not in the size of the mustard seed. The word there is more to make you understand it's the type of seed. So Jesus isn't concerned about the size. He's talking about the type. Now, to kind of confirm this, what's interesting is right before this passage, um, it's talking about the parable of the sower, which many of you know, but I'll read for those of you who don't. It's in, in verse 1, 13. That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and a large crowd gathered to him. So he got on a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying... Behold, the sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seeds, fell beside the road, and the birds came up and ate them. And others fell on rocky places, and they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out, and others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Him who has ears, let him hear. And then Jesus goes on to explain the parable to his disciples, but not to the crowd. He said, because they'll hear without hearing. And we're still in that predicament today. The, the, the words of, of Scripture and the words of Jesus are so often spiritually discerned. Right? Victoria and I were talking this week, and somebody told her about a weird dream she had had um, involving these puppies and she had given this gift of the puppies to someone. And so she was wondering what puppy means and, and I've, I used to do this in the past too where you, you go online and you're like, you know, what do puppies mean in dreams, right? But see, the problem is that's not how spirit works. There is no meaning of puppies in dreams. Now, if you see the devil in a dream, that might mean something very specific to everyone. But typically... Symbols and dreams only mean things to the person who's having the dream, right? Because, you know, Dennis might have had a dream, you know, when, when he's young, or now, uh, about puppies. But maybe he lost a puppy when he was really little. And so puppies bring up tragedy to him. So what the Lord's speaking to him is very specific about tragedy. Where somebody always, you know, wanted a puppy, but their dad would never give them a puppy. And so they, they were always upset and never felt their father's love because they never got the puppy they wanted. So that puppy means something specific to somebody else. And another person might have grown up with puppies and always had them in their life and it brought them a lot of joy. And so then that means something. Do you see? 
So, so the symbols are only ever specific to you. This is why you need spiritual revelation to understand what God is speaking to you in a dream. Or find somebody who's got a gift of interpreting dreams, you know, if you, if you're, if you struggle with that. So, <laughs> just put that on Facebook. <laughs> no, really, no, if you're struggling, call me because I, I, I do this. So, um, I, I just, I love it because it, it's just, a, it, it's just a gift and some people have it and, and whatever and I don't, I don't, you can't work it up. It's just people tell me their dreams and they can be very complex and then I just know what they mean. It's just sometimes very clear. And sometimes I'm like, you had too much pizza. I don't know, like, it's, it's stupid. Or, or go ask the Lord, I don't know. But often the Lord will show me what it means. But why it's important when you're looking at the parables of Jesus is the very same thing. When God is speaking to you, and this is why Jesus even spoke in parables, because they're, mo they're supposed to have multi-layer meetings. And they're supposed to work in all cultures and in all time. This is why he doesn't give us exact things, but speaks in spiritual metaphor, of which we call parable. Because then you can read and you can glean things from it. So even though, let's say the book of Revelation that we believe happens in 70 AD and is for the current church... Um, I had a great meeting with a guy this week. Actually, we're going to have him here at the church. He's another pastor in the city. His name's Leo. And um, I've invited him. He's got a book coming out. He's actually got three books coming out, one at a time. And they're all on the book of Revelation. And he, he teaches the position we, we believe here. Um, met with another pastor that I know up in Edmonton who also teaches through the book of Revelation. But this is really like a verse by verse. And he deals with Matthew 24, 25, Daniel, like... He's, he's written 300,000 words on, on this book. It's exhaustive, right? And just a really sweet, tender guy. So we're going to do an interview-style uh, talk at this coming March uh, when his book comes out, and then we will have it available for you guys. And he was just blowing my mind. We went out for coffee and just thing after thing that I didn't know about Jewish culture and which just added so much color um, to, to so many of the passages that haven't made sense to me, but he just added all this yeah. living color in that all of a sudden just made, made glorious sense. Um, I'll tell you one for fun, because I have time to do my thing. Um, one of the things that he brought up that I just had no idea that, and, and this will trigger some of you, you'll, you'll connect the dots, but in, in the culture where Jesus was growing up in, in the Jewish culture, that it was, it, it was the custom that when someone got married, you were betrothed to somebody and they were considered your spouse at the time of betrothal. So we have engagement periods where you're not married till you're married, but when you're betrothed to somebody, you're, that's your husband or that's your wife at that time. So what happens is then there's this waiting period, and I don't remember if it's a year or how long, but what the groom then does is the groom goes and, and um, uh, builds a bridal suite um, at the father's house and I was really curious and I said to him because so my brain's spinning as he's talking and I'm, I'm just getting so effed up um, I was trying to explain it to Jesse after how excited I was and I said I just had my mind blown I said it's like it's like if I told you I figured out a way to convert snow into gold that would be very exciting that's how I feel and <laughs> so we were having this great talk and he was he was I said where in the father's house would they build this bridal suite? And he said, well, you can go today and look, but mostly they build it upstairs. So it's on the, on the top, top level. Now that's gonna mean something in a minute. So then it's reminiscent of the words of Jesus when he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And in my father's house, there's many bridal rooms is what he said. <clears throat> so there's room for all of you in my father's house. So Jesus was making a betrothal. Now how do we know that too? Is because this is why John is actually baptizing people in the Jordan. Because before you got married, both the bride and the groom would go through baptism. They would go through mitzvah and be washed and cleansed for the ceremony of marriage. And it is why these people are turning and being baptized. And it is why Jesus comes to John and says, you must baptize me so that all righteousness should be fulfilled. Why else would Jesus be baptized to his own cause? It doesn't make sense. But he is actually being cleansed to be the bridegroom. And it is after this time that he then says, I go to prepare a place for you. So interestingly, in Acts 2, where does the church meet? But in the upper room, right? And so they get the deposit of the Holy Spirit, which is this 
the, um, what do you call them, the, the wedding gift almost, the uh, dowry, right? The Holy Spirit is our dowry that we received in hopes in the time for the bridegroom to come and receive us, right? Just so beautiful. So when you know some of that culture, you understand the language of Jesus speaking, and it takes it from black and white to, to living color in those passages. So why is Jesus using this example of the mustard seed? And what I, what I want to propose to you is when you go back into the parable of the sower, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's irrelevant of the size of the mustard seed. No one's looking and going, oh, the sower's sowing the wrong seed. The seed's the problem. The seed's not the problem, right? In the parable of the sower, what's the problem? Well, the problem's the ground. The problem is the weeds. The problem is the birds. The problem's not the seed. The seed doesn't have a problem. Now, presumably, it's probably mustard seed that he's sowing randomly. Now, partly because mustard seed grows wild. So what is it about the mustard seed that's unique? So when you... When you look and you study a little bit about mustard seeds, there's some very unique things. Mustard seeds, as they as they grow and develop, they grow wild. And it's, and it's interesting that Jesus even says this because he talks about it being a garden plant, but mustard seed's not a garden plant. And Jesus knows this, obviously, when he's saying this, because you never plant mustard seed in a garden because it will kill all your plants. That's what mustard seed does. It grows wild, and then it grows taller than the other plants and blocks out the sunshine, and so the other plants just die, right? So why is Jesus talking about the garden? Well, he's talking about Eden. He's talking about the garden of this planet, this restoring Eden, and this is what the kingdom is like. He then later goes on in this same passage in 13 to talk about that the kingdom of God's like yeast that works its way through the whole batch of dough and causes it to rise. But what's important about the mustard seed is interesting that as it grows up, its, its leaves or its pods, it develops these pods, and each pod has four seeds in it. It's interesting that that's how many Gospels there are. But there's four seeds that happen, and when that pod bursts or breaks open, those seeds fall to the ground, and what's very unique about the mustard seed is they instantly germinate upon touching the soil. As soon as they touch the soil, those seeds germinate and they begin to grow. So you have to think of it like dandelions, right? That, that would, Jesus might use dandelions for us, right? And, and they just go crazy, right? It's like a little bit of breeze and all those white fluffy things go and you go, oh, how pretty, until they take over everything and those weeds grow like crazy and then you can't get rid of them. So the mustard seed does a similar thing. So, so it, it just grows up, it grows wild, and the idea is it takes everything over. So here, let's kind of put those two parables together. The problem in us developing faith is that we're constructing it incorrectly in our minds. Because we're thinking of it in terms of size and that I need more. But Jesus is saying you only need one type of seed, and that is like the mustard seed. So your faith needs to be like mustard seed. They need to be of the same type, not size. Size is irrelevant because like I've just said, mustard seed goes to the ground, takes over the whole garden. So you don't need a big mustard seed to do that. You just need a mustard seed. You need that type of seed. Because if you plant a potato seed, you get potatoes and potatoes only grow in one part and they don't take over the garden. So thank God the kingdom of God is not like potatoes, right? There's some denominations that are like potatoes um, and they don't go anywhere, right? Because they've got the wrong kind of seed. They're not planting the, wrong, the right kind of life. So the question is not how do I increase the size of my faith, but how do I focus in on the type of faith? Now what's interesting is as the sower is going out to sow these seeds, different problems occur. The birds of the air come in, and, and, and Jesus later says this is like the enemy that comes to steal the seeds away from you. And these seeds are all about and relating to the kingdom of God. That is what they are about. The weeds crop up, and it says it's the cares of the world and, and issues around money and, and just fear about money. Those are, those are the weeds that Jesus describes. And, and the shallow ground or the rocky ground, in some ways, is people who receive the word, and we've seen this lots in, in, in the time of our ministry, they receive the word of grace, 
but then there's no roots. The roots don't go down deep enough. It stays shallow, and eventually the sun rises. Jesus says the sun is like trials and tribulations that occur in, the, in their lives, and then it just scorches the plant, and the plant dies because it can't get moisture. It doesn't go deep with God, right? There's no depth to it. It just thinks that grace is a new teaching, and then they try to hold to that teaching, but then when the hardship comes, it just burns that away because they haven't connected that to intimacy with the Lord. And I'm, I'm seeing this in the progressive movement. It's happening all the time. In the progressive movement of Christianity, there are tons of people that the seed has fallen on rocky ground because they come out of, um, out of denominations, uh, and I don't want to pick on the Baptists, but they, a lot of them will come out of a Baptist denomination that is very anti the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're anti the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so the problem with that, if you don't receive the baptism of the Spirit, you know, you, you're going to have an issue. Because water baptism is a baptism of the flesh. Baptism of the Spirit is a baptism of the Spirit, right? This, this world that we're, this walk that we're walking on, this spiritual walk is a spiritual one. It is not natural. Now, when you lived in a natural system, you needed natural baptism. You needed natural mitzvah. When you walked in a temple system where there was physical animal sacrifice, physical blood atonement for sin, then you needed a physical washing of water to be cleansed to go and do these things. But now we are walking in through Jesus into a spiritual kingdom that things are discerned spiritually and they must be lived out spiritually, which is why you need a spiritual baptism. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that is required to live this life. Without it, then you are still going through the methods, as most Christians do, of just trying to do water baptism and trying to do their communion, trying to stay right with God and trying to live the good life. And it becomes morality instead of about a living from the Spirit, being led by the Spirit into spiritual things. Do you guys see the difference? And so when we're talking about mustard seed, it is, it is God's desire that as he plants the mustard seed, that you, you take that in. And so how does the enemy come and steal the mustard seed? How do the birds come in? How do the weeds choke it up? It's because it chokes out the very nature of the type of seed that it is. So for example, well, I was illustrating to you earlier, uh, you know, just kind of what I went through this week. I have the choice in that time to allow, because I can hear the birds coming, right? You hear negative words, somebody speaks negativity to you, or the negativity happens in your own head about who you are, what you've done in the past, how you'll never get to where you want to go in the future, or, or whatever horrible things that your self-talk does, or the enemy talks, that's the birds coming, right? sometimes you feel like you're in that old movie the birds right it's like there's like flocks of them coming right some of you you've whittled it down you've shot a few out of the air but but for some of us the flocks of birds come in and you're like oh boy how am i going to stop this from coming and so the birds of the air come and out and now and some of us are even in a situation where not only are the birds coming the sun's rising and all we see is rocks in the ground right so it's it's like a multifaceted problem we're already afraid about, about the future. We, we have fear around money. We, we have a fear around our well-being. So that's already there going on. We're having struggle going deep with the Lord because we're, we're already filled with a bunch of fear. And then all the negative thoughts come on top of it. And this is where so many people live. Christian, not Christian, doesn't matter, right? See, and here's the issue. If Jesus isn't good for your life and you, you've only believed in him as good for death, then there is no point of 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 the kingdom of god or faith or all of this it's, it's pointless and so much of the church has just accepted jesus as their personal lord and savior into their little heart so that they will go to heaven and that's as far as it goes that is their christianity and then the rest of trials and tribulations just becomes i just have to endure it i just have to endure it because god's watching and he's wanting to make sure that i pass because if i don't pass i have to go around the mountain and i will be displeasing to him so i have to honor god in the trial that's why, why, why we would just hear these stories about people who've gone through horrible tragedies or difficult sicknesses or diseases, and they're like, but they really honor God in their sickness. 
Now, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't go through it and give praise to God and everything, but there's just something off about that. There's just something insidious in that thinking that I'm going to go through struggles and prove that no matter what I go through, I'll still exalt Jesus, right? Because I'm committed. You, you see where that darkness kind of starts to slip in. That no matter what I suffer, no matter what I go through, I, I've stood strong, I've stood on the word, and I've believed God. And God's not looking for that from you. He's not looking for that out of you. It's not, it's not that kind of challenge. The, the, the trials and tribulations we go through is to produce a faith that walks you out of it. The point isn't for you to endure it to die or to suffer into oblivion. God, God isn't putting things on you for to suffer. The human condition starts out suffering. The human condition walked out of Eden with the knowledge of evil. We already intrinsically are suffering from shame, guilt, condemnation, fear, unbelief. We're already suffering. So God doesn't put it on us. We're already in that state. He comes to rescue us out of it and to try to plant a new garden. So that's why he's always throwing out the seeds. These seeds are the seeds of the kingdom. So when you are going through these difficult times, whatever your situation is, as you're going through it, it is then saying, <laughs> like that song, it's not, it's not saying, Lord, this is all for you. He's going, no, this is all about you. I'm trying to train you. I'm already trained. I'm already God. <laughs> he's, not, he's not God in training. Uh, you, might, you might be, but he's not. You are a child of God. You are sons and daughters of God, and you are being changed and transformed to become like him. So that's going to require some things for you to overcome in faith. So when I'm talking about this, how do I develop that faith, that mustard seed faith? When Jesus is saying, if you have this type of faith, you can move mountains. So let me explain something. I'm almost done. The beauty is this, and I love it that it says this in Philippians, that, that God is the author and the finisher of your mustard seed. Huh? He's the author and the finisher of it. That he who began the sowing and the planting is faithful and just to complete the work of the gardener in your life to produce faith. Okay? Because at one time we are all those kinds of seeds. Later in the passage, it's the, it's the parable of the wheat and the tares. And it, and it says that the wheat and the seeds of wheat and tares go out at the same time. And everyone's upset. Well, what should we do? Because now there's weeds mixed in with the tares. What are we going to do? And, and, and the voice of Jesus is saying, well, we're, we're going to let it all grow up together. And in the end, at the end of time, then the, the angels will come through and harvest. And then it will separate the wheat and tares. And we're going to burn the tares because those are the sons of the devil. And then the sons of God, then they're the wheat. And that's good. We all go, oh, see, this is the passage on hell. Because the tares go and get burned. That's the hell place, right? No, no not right. That, it's, it's a parable, right? Let me say it again. It's, it's a parable. It's not a literal place of, of, of fire and torment. So what's it talking about? Well, specifically, Jesus, this is in the book of Matthew. So it's a very Jewish book, and he's warning them again about 70 AD of what's going to happen, that the Lord was going to separate true Israel from apostate Israel. True Israel would come to Jesus. Apostate Israel would stay in Jerusalem. There was a fire that burned Jerusalem. Many of them died. Christians escaped. Josephus not said not a single Christian life was lost. Jesus is specifically speaking about that, but he is also speaking into our lives too. Okay? Because there are tares. Now, what's so interesting about a tear is that when you look at wheat and you look at a tear, they look identical. That's why evangelicalism looks exactly like what we're doing. It looks the same. We sing the same songs, we preach, we sing, we have coffee, right? <laughs> right? We have groups, the women get together, the men never get together, we gotta change it up, and you boo, I know, we're, we're, we're working on it, right? So we do groups just like they do, we talk about Jesus just like they do, right? We talk about grace, it's not that they don't, they don't say, don't say grace, that's a swear word. They all talk about grace. They know nothing about it, but they talk about it, right? 
Some people think God's grace is that we're elected and the rest of the people are going to hell. See, that's God's wonderful and beautiful grace. No, that's a really crap satanic doctrine. But we use the same language. It looks the same. And, but as it grows up, there's something very subtle that happens. Something changes. When wheat and tares are immature and they're small... See, when I was small in grace and still immature, I was still as angry as the people preaching hellfire brimstone. I was just as angry, maybe more angry than those people. So it didn't look any different at that time. But as time goes on and as we grow up and as we mature, something very interesting happens that starts to separate the wheat from the tares. Because wheat produces fruit. The fruit that is the grain inside the buds, right? The bran or whatever is in there. The germ. I'm just throwing out the words germ. to like get it. Germ. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Some. Yeah. It's not bread. I'm not a farmer, but. Not bread. You know. it's bread. But what happens is when the wheat becomes full of the fruit of that grain, the head of it gets heavy, and it begins to bow down. And if you go by a wheat field when it's fully mature, you'll see all the stalks bowing down, and this is what happens. When you start to understand the grace of God and the kingdom of God comes to you, well, guess what happens in your heart? Humility and grace and you bow. You see, so I don't stand in judgment of other sinners because I recognize it is only the grace of God that has saved me from shame and guilt and condemnation. Why would I be hurling this person into hell? I, I already realize there's been a log in my eye the whole life. I'm not trying to remove their speck. I might see their logs and specks, but I know that's the work of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit that does surgery on them to remove it. That's not my job. And so there's a humility, but tares, tares are opposite. Tares stand straight up at attention. I'm committed to Jesus. I am more than an overcomer. Brother, you're going to go to hell for doing that because you haven't repented of your sins like me. Right? That's what a tear does. And they're very visibly noticed during the times of maturity. So they're very easily to be separated. But here's the thing. That's just not the people out there. That's all inside of us. There are tares inside of us. And there's wheat inside of us. And God is trying to separate those words of death that have come from the devil and the enemy and darkness and the lies that are embittered in our own soul from generation to generation. This is why it appears there's such thing as generational curses, but there is not. There's only generational beliefs, right? My dad, my grandpa was a bum. My dad was a bum. I'm going to be a bum, right? My great-grandfather was an abuser, my grandfather was an abuser, my dad's abuser, and I'm just terrified I'm going to become an abuser, right? They're generational beliefs, generational lies, not generational curses. The curse is embedded in the belief of the lie. If you break the lie, you break the curse. You understand? God's not visiting it. God's not punishing. God's not doing that. So the seeds of the kingdom are what I believe. And what is the kingdom of God? Scripture is really clear. It's righteousness... And where do we get that from? Where do we get the righteousness from? From our good works, from my commitment, from my attendance, from my mission trip? Is that where I attain righteousness? No, I attain righteousness because I go, I am not righteous, you are righteous, and your Holy Spirit dwells within me. I've been baptized into your righteousness. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in and through me. I've been fully made righteous, so therefore I am righteous. My righteousness comes from Christ. Okay? That's the kingdom of God. When you believe that, it transforms your life. And the next part of the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, that there becomes a peace in your life because we strive to enter God's rest. When we strive to enter that rest, we become peaceful because we know the work has been finished on the cross. I'm not striving to be a good person. I am becoming a good person because the seeds of righteousness, which is this kingdom seed, has already been planted in me. It's already been planted. The DNA and all the information to create what needs to be created in me has already been placed in, and it is beginning to grow. My only contributing factor in this is that as I abide in the presence of the living water, which is what Jesus gives out, as I listen to his words, as I abide in his presence through me communicating, either through prayer or through worship to him, you see, my ground is being watered. I'm getting water in the soil. My roots are going deep. Where are roots heading? 
they're heading to the water. They're heading to get water underground, to get moisture, to get nutrients out of the soil. And so as I began to worship and as I began to pray, my roots began to go deep. And I'd be able to understand the love of God so that when the birds come, the seed has already germinated. Because I'm like, I don't believe in birds. You're all lying. It doesn't matter what you say about me. Go ahead. Go ahead and say whatever you say. The thing is, is no longer I live, but Christ lives in me and you've got nothing on him. You can't say negative anything about Jesus. And his spirit is abiding in me and it's transforming me. And that is the type of faith that God is wanting you to have. The type of faith is that mustard seed faith of kingdom that says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I will rest in the finished work of Jesus, which brings peace to my mind, fills my heart with love, and in, inevitably endows you with power so you rise up to such a standard that the birds even can come and nest in your branches. And even the dark thoughts that happen all over this world will finally come to an end because you will have killed out every other plant in your life. Plants of deception and unbelief and doubt and anger and rage against yourself, depression, oppression, anxiety, fear over money. All of these things that try to cripple us, all the other plants in the garden that have been growing many years, you don't have to try to address them. Get your roots down deep. You don't have to address all of the other plants. You will naturally address them. Don't worry about growing your faith. Your faith will just grow. God's in the business. He is the gardener. You aren't. None of you are horticulturists. No, no spiritual horticulturists here this morning. Nobody's handing out that business card. I'm a master spiritual horticulturist. So why are we trying to do that? Give up on that task. Just go, all I have to do, I don't have to figure out all my problems. I don't figure out how to grow my business. I don't need to figure out how to fix my marriage. I don't need how to figure out how to fix my depression, fix my anxiety, overcome my fear, be a better parent, be a better spouse, overcome my money issues. I don't have, you don't have to worry about any of that. This is how you enter God's rest. This is not my problem. It's not my garden. I belong to God and I'm not the gardener. I am a vine that is connected, or I'm a branch that's connected to the main vine. I don't have to try to strive to suck stuff out of the vine. It's just what happens when I abide. The branch doesn't try to pop out oranges, it just abides in the branch that's already producing oranges. And when you've been grafted in, you just go, oh, hey, and, you, and I've done sport. You just hang out and you're just like, oh, and you're just like, oh an orange, oh, that's nice. That no branch. You don't ever see branches sweating. No branches are sweating. You don't hear branches, oh, I'm trying so hard to make orange. <laughs> they don't. They don't even know they're making oranges. They're oblivious. They're just like, I'm a branch. It's a sunny day. Oh, there's an orange. Oh. That's it. It's that simple. <laughs> but we're all striving to produce the fruit. But the fruit is the fruit of what? of the spirit. spirit so spirit has to produce fruit not you the spirit produces the fruit in you as you abide in the spirit you just have to abide your only goal is to abide why do you think worship is so important in this church it's not our singing time it's not oh Matt Victoria they really like the singing no no this is our abiding time this is when we abide this is when we abide, when we push everything away and all our thoughts. And you know what? If you can't even get in there, you just need to get into the meditation of it. Because guess what? Even atheists are doing meditation because they figured out it works. It figures out to meditate on something other than you and your problems and your issues and come to a state of peace so that you can just enjoy what's happening. It moves you to a higher state of consciousness, supposedly opens up a third eye you've got somewhere spiritually in the brain, and then all these things communicate to you. It's like whatever weirdness you want to believe. We're just talking about Jesus and his kingdom. You want to believe in third eyes, believe in third eyes. Whatever is going to help you just rest and meditate in the goodness of God. And when those lying thoughts come, don't even worry so much about fighting them all. Just focus on what's true. None of this is true. None of this is reality. I am loved. I am cherished, I am adored, 
My roots go deep with the Lord. He will never leave me, never forsake me. He's the author and finisher of my faith. He will, the work he began in me, he will faithfully complete that work. And I can just rest in that and live my life and follow the desires of my heart and enjoy the experience that life has given me instead of always trying to be a Christian. Do not try to increase the size of your faith. Accept the type of faith that has already been planted in you and let it grow wild as you abide in Jesus. Amen. Amen.